Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, it's Trinity Sunday, of course, this Sunday, and uh, uh, that means that last Sunday we, we focused on the third person of the Trinity, the, the Holy Spirit given to us at Pentecost, and I like that we do this. I like that we take a day to reflect on the Trinity itself before we move into the time of the church, this, this long season where there's green on the altar and we focus on things like Christian growth. I, I like that we take a minute to reflect on God. And that's really what Trinity Sunday is about. It's about taking time out to reflect on the nature of who God is. The thing about that question, though, who is God, is you really can't answer it without also asking the question, what has God done? Because if you read through Scripture, the Word of God really doesn't spend a whole lot of time just sort of reflecting on the nature of God, like philosophically. God reveals himself through what he does, through his actions. And so when you ask, who is God, you also kind of have to ask the question, what has God done? And to answer those two questions, or to, to think about those two questions, I want to take a look this morning at our Old Testament reading from Isaiah chapter 6, because he walks us through it actually really well with what he describes uh, in the reading. And so we're going to take that reading in three chunks. And, and we're going to see this morning that our God is majestic, our God is merciful, and our God is missional. And, and so let's dive right in. You can follow along in your bulletin if you want to. I'm going to go verses 1 through 4 to start off with. So this is the beginning of the reading. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting up on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. In the year that King Uzziah died, this is the vision that Isaiah sees. And really what he does for these first four verses is he just tells us about it. And that's kind of it. Notice the difference between Uzziah's throne throne and God's. Uzziah's throne is empty in the year that King Uzziah died, but not God's throne. The divine throne that Isaiah sees is full. You've got to read a little carefully, but all over the place in this reading, there's stuff about God being king. So he's seated on his throne. The divine throne is full. God is majestic, and he's so majestic that his throne doesn't contain him. The train of his robe fills the whole temple with the glory or the presence of God. And in fact, we hear from the angels that it's not even limited to that. At the end of the reading, it's the whole earth is filled with the glory of God. All of God's creation is full of his glory. And in this vision, what Isaiah does, basically, again, he just sort of describes it to us. He tells us what he sees. He marvels at the majesty of God. You can get little pieces of this in creation. Uh, of this kind of experience, you know, looking at the things that God has done, the things that God has made. Uh, sometimes it's the national parks, you know, if you've been to the Grand Canyon or Mount Rainier or one of those places with something really big and huge and massive that you sort of stare out into and reflect on its vastness. Or if you look up at the stars at night and you reflect on like the vastness of the universe. I had an experience like this not too long ago. It was uh, when, we, when we had the northern lights visible. Anybody go out and see the northern lights when they were here? Yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, and and uh, we, we went out on the Saturday night, so we actually missed them on the first night. But I went out with, uh, with, <laughs> with Isaiah, my son, not Isaiah the prophet. And uh, we went out north of Jerseyville to where it was, uh, it was real dark and, uh, and, and looked, of course, to the north. And we, we got to see the Northern Lights, a so big deal for me. Ever si I'm kind of an astronomy nerd, if you don't already know that about me. So uh, ever since I knew that the Northern Lights existed, I'd always wanted to see them. And, and I missed them in Alaska. I missed them a couple times in Kansas City. So for many, many years, I'd wanted to, to do this and finally got to see them uh, when they were visible here. They weren't super bright. But we got to see all the cool stuff. You know, we got to see the colors, the, the, the green and the red. We got to see the pillars that they sometimes make. And we got to see the flashing that happens with the northern lights. And before too long, they were gone. But we got the chance uh, to sort of marvel and wonder. And while we were there, while we were out on that country road out in the middle of nowhere, we really didn't say much to each other. 
we kind of just sat in silence most of the time, sort of looking up at the wonder. And if we said anything at all, it mostly had to do with, uh, like, well, look at that, or, uh, or just kind of wondering at the fact that, wow, this is amazing that we get to be out in here and see this. What we didn't do in that moment was try to explain it. What we didn't do was seek more information. Now, so, so I know a little bit about the Northern Lights. We probably all do. It has something to do with solar radiation hitting the atmosphere. I don't exactly know. And as it turns out, nobody completely knows. I mean, scientists can tell you a lot more than, than, uh, than what I just said. But what they can't do, at least not yet, is tell you, go here at this time, and you'll see them. They're kind of unpredictable. We can't quite pin them down. And I think with the Trinity we run the risk of trying to explain and sacrificing the marvel and the wonder. See, the only source of information that I had out on that road in Jerseyville was my phone. It's the only place I could have looked for more information, and it literally would have wrecked the experience. Because I look at my phone, and what happens? No more night vision. I can't see the northern lights anymore. In an effort to explain, I would have destroyed the marvel. And again, we do that with the Trinity an awful lot. It's easy here when we say the Athanasian Creed and there's all that technical language, it's easy to kind of look at the Athanasian Creed and say, yeah, well, that's a great example of trying to explain the Trinity. But I don't think that's exactly what it's doing. I think what the Athanasian Creed is doing is this. I think it's trying to mine the Word of God for absolutely everything that we can that, that tells us about the nature of God. It's an attempt to go as far as Scripture will let us go, as far as God has revealed things about himself, and not a step farther. Because at the end of the Athanasian Creed, I mean, really, it just describes what God tells us. God is three, God is one, and what does that mean? I don't know. That's what the Athanasian Creed tells us. What we do very often, and ironically, the simplest explanations of the Trinity are usually an attempt to kind of get our head around something that's just a mystery. You've heard these before, probably. God is like an egg, for example. There's the shell, there's the white, and there's the yolk. And the problem with that one is a shell is not an egg, and a yolk is not an egg, and yet Jesus is fully and completely God in every way that the Father is fully and completely God. Or maybe you've heard this one, God is like water. He can be ice, or he can be solid, he can be liquid, or he can be gas. And that's great, but one molecule of water cannot be all three of those things at the same time, and yet God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all at the same time. All of those analogies break down, and what they also do is they, they, they attempt to get our head around something that's a mystery. You ever notice what happens when you use one of those analogies with somebody? They kind of go, oh, now I get it, and we move on in an attempt to explain in an attempt to go farther and outside of what Scripture shows us, we lose the marvel. We lose the wonder. But Trinity Sunday, I think, is about the marvel and the wonder of a mystery that we can't explain. The marvel and the wonder of, a nature, of the nature of our God that is outside of our rational capabilities. And often when you're looking at something that you just can't get your head around, something else happens too you start to reflect on yourself. And you start to ask yourself how you fit in. If you've been out to one of those you know, big vistas or stars at night or something like that, what often happens with us is we'll look at something vast and big that we can't quite get our head around and then we'll think back to ourselves. If I see something big, I'll notice how small I am. If I see something very complex, I'll realize how simple I can be. And that's exactly what Isaiah does here in Isaiah chapter 6. So continuing on, again, if you're following along in your bulletin, uh, I'm going to do 5 through 7. So Isaiah has seen the wonder of God, and here's what he says in verse 5. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. Isaiah sees the glory of God and he recognizes his own weakness. He sees the holiness of God and he sees his own uncleanness. 
He sees the righteousness of God, and he sees his own sin, his own unrighteousness, his own unworthiness to be in the presence of the God of all creation. When you wonder at something vast, it makes you feel pretty small. And God is no exception. When you come into contact with God, in the presence of the holy God, it causes you to reflect on your own sin and your own unworthiness. But notice what happens. And, and I, this, is, this is a serious reflection on Isaiah's part, by the way. He's really worried. Woe is me is how he starts it off. And we use that as kind of like being sad or being down on yourself or something like that. But woe in the Bible is a funeral word. If you say woe about somebody, it means they're dead. Isaiah's saying, I'm a dead man here. And look at what God does immediately when, when Isaiah figures out his position. The angel comes picks up the coal with the tongs and comes specifically and personally and directly to Isaiah, touches his lips and says, your sin is atoned for. You are forgiven. God is triune, and I don't know what that means. What I do know, though, is what God does. The holy God comes to sinners. The holy God meets people where they are. God doesn't just say to Isaiah, everybody's forgiven, so you're good to go. No, he comes to Isaiah. And we see that in the New Testament when Jesus comes to us. One of the Trinity took on flesh. One of the Trinity became a human being. One of the Trinity took on our sin, my sin and your sin. One of the Trinity went to the cross. One of the Trinity suffered and died so that we could be forgiven. And in the waters of your baptism, God does exactly what he does for Isaiah. He comes to you, specifically, personally, individually, and in mercy, and says your sin is atoned for, your guilt is forgiven, and you are mine. Our God is majestic, and yet he is also merciful in how he deals with with human beings. You have a God who is not only infinitely majestic, but also infinitely merciful, infinitely forgiving of your sins because of the death and the resurrection of his son. And the mercy of God changes things. The mercy of God makes you different, just like it made Isaiah different. So let's finish up the reading here. This is verse 8, very last verse. Isaiah is speaking, and I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here am I, send me. Look how different that is than the first thing that we hear Isaiah say. The first thing he says is, woe is me for I'm a man of unclean lips. And the last thing he says after he's experienced the mercy of God is, here am I, send me. God's mercy, it gives you new life, but it also gives you new purpose. It gives you new things to do. It gives you new jobs, new goals. It gives your life new meaning. It changes you. It changes things. And it makes you part of God's mission because God is not only majestic, he's not only merciful, but he's also missional. When you experience the mercy of God, it's something you just got to share. This happens outside, too, and all those other wonder, uh, wonderful things that you, that you see and you, you like marvel at. You just got to show, you got to tell the story, right? That, that's why the Northern Lights are a sermon illustration this morning. You got to tell the story. But have you noticed that when you do that, words almost always fall short? If you saw, anybody see the total eclipse? Like, did you see the whole thing? Ever try to describe that to somebody who hasn't seen it? It's really hard. You can't quite describe it, right? Words often fall short with that stuff. So it would make sense that with an infinitely majestic God, words would fall even shorter. And when you're talking about the majesty of God, that's true. We can't get our heads around it, and we can't get our words around it either. But when you're talking of the mercy of God, that's a different story. Because communicating his mercy, I mean, words can be very, very simple. And the real miracle of who God is, is that he works through those words your words are used by the Holy Spirit, even when they're simple, even when they're basic, and even when they come in contexts that you might not even think about. 
I heard something about this this week. I was listening to a podcast. And there was a, a woman by the name of Samantha. Sam was uh, what she went by, and Sam was telling her story. And, and Sam had gone through some, some pretty awful childhood trauma, and in the midst of this really traumatic event, she lost both her younger brother and her mother in the space of just a couple of hours. It was an awful thing that happened to her, and she, uh, uh, she spent years kind of dealing with that, as you would expect. It was about 10 years where she walked away from the faith and uh, uh, was either an atheist or was really, really angry at God. And, and things changed a little bit when she had her own kids. Because what happened is she had a really rambunctious two-year-old, and uh, if, you've, if you've been a parent before, you know that at those times, often what you do is you go back to your own parents, and you go, <laughs> for one thing, you go, thanks, guys, for everything you put up with when I was a two-year-old. And for another thing, you often ask them, how did you do this? What did you do? What do I do? And, and Sam was thinking, man, I wish I could ask my mom that. I wish I could ask her what she would do. And she'd often reflect on what would my mom do in this time. What she'd always come back to was my mom would go back to her Bible. And so she did, finally, once. And she'd never really opened the Bible. She'd never really read it before. But she remembered some Sunday school teacher way back saying something about John 3.16. And so she opened the Bible. She found John 3.16. And she read those very simple words about the mercy of God. And because these two ordinary people, her mom and the Sunday school teacher, had spoken God's word to her in her moment of need, she read, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And everything changed. The way that she describes that moment is she said, I felt like I met Jesus for the first time that day. And everything was different in her life. And it has been ever since she's a Christian to this day. Everything changed because the word of God that was spoken to her. Our God is majestic. Our God is merciful. But he's also missional. He's majestic in all creation. He is merciful to your sin. And he is missional in that he uses your words, the words that you will speak when you walk out of here in very ordinary places that you don't even think about. He will use those words to bring people to faith, to bring people to him, and to bring people to salvation. Amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding guard our hearts and our minds, keeping them steadfast in Christ Jesus.